Well, welcome. My name is Kyle Allred. I'm excited to be here with Dr. John Campbell and Dr. Roger Schwelt. Both are outstanding medical educators who have worked tremendously hard over the past year to make sense of the relentless amount of COVID-19 information that has evolved over the past year. And both have shared their perspective with a large audience. Uh, you can read more about both of them in the video description below. And uh, I'm excited to hear both of your perspectives on a wide range of COVID-19 uh, related questions. Thank you to everyone who posted questions that we could use for this Q&A event. And uh, before we get started, I uh, want to give you both a chance to say hello. So I'll start with you, uh, Dr. Schwelt in Southern California. Good morning. Good morning, Kyle. And, and really a, a, a wonderful big good morning to Dr. John Campbell for joining us. John, it's, it's really um, something to have you on. I've been watching you for a long time. You've, you've been uh, prolific. You've been one of the uh, clear voices on the internet in terms of the describing and keeping pace with COVID-19. So really, really a uh, privilege to be with you. And with you, I've been watching you for a long, long time now, Roger. It's, uh, it's, it's just amazing to be able to talk in live time. And it's good afternoon from me. And I'm seriously impressed that you guys are, you guys must have been up at six o'clock this morning, had your <laughs> breakfast, got, got, got dressed, brushed your teeth and, and ready to go for seven o'clock. It's impressive. So, so thank you. Doc, Dr. Schwell never, never sleeps. I, I, think <laughs> I I've, thought not. I've learned that by now working with him. <laughs> I suspected this. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to get started with a broad question uh, for both of you. And Dr. Campbell, I'll start with you on this one. Um, as we're into 2021 and we look back on 2020, mm. what, is, uh, what is one or two lessons that you hope that we can learn as a society mm. uh, from this pandemic? You know, I think one of the main issues all the way through this is that people have been reacting to circumstances as they came along, rather than anticipating, rather than being proactive. And I think we've seen this in the level of international organisations. They didn't really compute this concept that there could be a pandemic because it hasn't happened in people's living experience. They kind of thought it couldn't happen. Whereas, of course, we know it's happened before. We know pandemics have come and gone throughout human history. 1918 pandemic is, is, is a big example. You know, the majority of the population of the Americas wiped out by smallpox and other other communicable diseases on the, with the arrival of Europeans. But, but people just didn't seem to be able to conceptualise it, so they couldn't think ahead. So, you know, even people like the World Health Organization, the government of the United States, the government of the United Kingdom, it seems to me that they were re reacting to things. So I think the big lesson is we need to anticipate potential problems because, you know, as well as the field of disease, you know, that there could well be another pandemic. But there's so many other problems for us as an individual humans, groups of humans and humanity. And, and I really just feel we need to be proactive, anticipate things and uh, not, not just wait for things to go wrong and then react to them, as really has been the pattern that I've seen over the past uh, over the past year in terms of people reacting to this pandemic. Excellent. Yeah. Dr. Schwell, what are your thoughts? Oh, I totally agree with John. That is a very, very deep and profound uh, thought. I mean, I, I also noticed that as well. Um, the other thought I had was just uh, we could think in the theoretical. We can think about, oh, we need a vaccine. Oh, we need to do this. So we need to do that. But a lot of what has been left out of that equation, I think, is is bringing people along and getting them to buy into those sorts of things. So, for instance, we have had a most amazing year in terms of vaccine development. Probably we've never seen anything like this in terms of how rapidly we got so many different candidates to to market. But we see the problem in terms of the the misinformation out there and in terms of the uh, the the thoughts in the population about whether or not they would want to actually have the vaccine. You know, there's been stories where these hospitals has, have received the vaccine, they finally have it, and yet 50, sometimes even 60% of the healthcare workers that are targeted for vaccination refuse to even have the vaccination. And I think it's because of misinformation. I think that's where people like John and myself and, and a number of other points of light out there are really vital to educate in layman's terms what it is that's going on so they can buy into this. The science is there, but mm. if people don't buy into it, it's not going to work. Mm. 
Speaking of... No, I agree completely. We've got, we've got to take people along with us, otherwise we're just talking to ourselves. And uh, if people aren't buying into wearing masks, vaccination, the appropriate behaviour, then we're not getting anywhere. Uh, it's an excellent point. Absolutely. And speaking of sources of information and potential misinformation, uh, both of you do so much educating and, and put out a lot of informative videos. How do you decide what information sources are credible and, and what's your process for receiving new information about COVID-19? And Dr. Schwell, I'll start with you on this one. Yeah, well, you know, we've seen this in the, in the media, unfortunately, way back in in the days of Walter Cronkite. Uh, that's a TV newscaster here in the United States. Um, it was all about the, 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 you know, the questions of journalists, the when, where, who, what, all of that sort of stuff. Um, that's kind of gone away. And we've now have narrative journalism where there's a certain narrative. They already know what the story is. And they go out and find these these pieces to fit the narrative. And, you know, when we get into a pandemic like this, where, where certainly a virus is at the center of that pandemic and science describes what viruses do and the consequences of that, where do you go for that? I mean, you, you look on uh, the network televisions here, at least in the United States, and what you see is uh, a drive-by type of a snapshot and, a, and a, uh, without any explanation. And so that's, that just doesn't do it for the type of information that we need. So where do you go? Well, the thing that tells you the who, when, where, and all of that in scientific journalism is papers. It's scientific papers. And that's not something that I learned until I went to medical school or, you know, or any kind of professional school. Uh, that's where you learn how to critically appraise a topic. And that's where you learn about the different levels of evidence with scientific journals and what is an observational study versus a randomized controlled trial and why would one be weighed over the other that's not something that's really intuitive to people in the general population so uh, and it's not something that they necessarily need to learn but they need to at least get their news sources from people who do understand that and who understand why that's the case mm -hmm. and so when you're getting your news sources now on coronavirus pandemic things of that nature make sure that it's evidence-based make sure the people that are telling you things are showing you the sources and you can read for yourself that's why that's why people like you know john and myself like to give the references for why we're telling you these things don't believe people don't believe us if you want to depend on us to sort of figure out what the what the science is you, you can do that, but also always remember that it's got to be backed up by science. Mm -hmm. Dr. Campbell. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. We're, we're looking for, for, for validity here is the key word, isn't it? You know, what, what is actually doing what it purports to do? So we need things to be research based whenever possible. And, and as Roger said, the, the better the quality of that trial, the better. And, and, and our gold standard is the randomized double blind control trial if we have it. We don't always have this. So sometimes we have to use correlations that can tell us where to look. So it's knowing a bit about research and, and, and research theory that really helps to to take out the good bits of that and to differentiate the good bits from from the bad bits. But as well as that, especially as clinicians, what we have to do is follow national guidelines. So in the UK, we have a few organisations that actually give national guidelines. And basically what they say is almost right by definition. Now, the people advising on these national guidelines are very good experts and good clinicians. But we have to follow national guidelines as well. And, and basically the, the, the main content and thrust between the national guidelines in the US and the UK is basically the same because it's based on people that understand this, this basic empirical science. And I think the other thing we do is it's surprising. If we take the totality of medical knowledge, I don't know what the latest figure is, but maybe about a quarter of that is research based. So, you know, actually with firm research findings behind that, a lot of it, you know, is more intuitive. It's more of, a, of an art process, if you like. But very often what we have to do is, is look at what makes sense based on our basic understanding of how the body works, the physiology, the structure, the anatomy and how it goes wrong, the pathophysiological processes. And then we need to kind of make sense of what we're doing in terms of those. So basically what we're saying is we, we can we can say what we want as long as we've got a rationale. And ideally, that rationale should be based on uh, empirical research based evidence. It can also be based on uh, national guidelines, which is essentially the consensus of evidence, uh, expert evidence.
but also we need to base it on our understanding of the way the body works and the way the body goes wrong. And, and, and the reassuring thing is, is if those three types of evidence agree, it's really quite nice. So it gets a bit confusing when you might get uh, an underpinning physiological rationale, which would imply one thing, and, and, and a research-based paper, which implies something else. But normally we find with time that the amount of, that, that the amount of harmony does grow and it does increase. So um, I, th I think they're the, they're the three things, but we have to make sure it's based on that. And, and of course, particularly as people that um, I suppose popularize this, we, we need to give the evidence. We need to be transparent as to where we are getting the evidence from. So you know, I don't I don't want anyone to listen to my opinion. I can't think of anything worse, you know. But <laughs> if, if I'm someone who is filtering uh, expert opinion, collective expert opinion, scientific rationales and um, research papers and condensing those. And that's a completely different thing. But I do believe, as Roger said, the onus is on us to give the evidence and to make the evidence available. Both of you mentioned, um, to some degree, following you know, national guidelines, um, favoring you know, solid evidence, randomized placebo-controlled trials when, when available. You know, in a perfect world, of course, we'd have a randomized placebo-controlled trial for everything, and we just know what the best interventions are. Of course, we're in the midst of a pandemic, and, and randomized controlled trials take time. Um, they're expensive. Um, so in light of that, um, there has been a, an increase towards getting information from preprints, you know, uh, articles mm -hmm. that haven't been peer reviewed and have been posted on servers and very valuable information there, but also the potential downside that these aren't peer reviewed. What are, what are your thoughts on the role of a preprint server, you know, pre-publication servers for a way to access information for not only scientists and, and educators, but also just the general public uh, and I'll start with you, Dr. Schwelt, on this question. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. So, so when it's not peer reviewed, you're not getting as much input onto the possibilities of where the study could have gone wrong um, or where there could have been confounders. And, and so sometimes many heads are better, well, most of the time, many heads are better than one at picking that out and saying, you know, this is what the study shows, but it may be showing this for a reason other than what the authors thought. You know, we live in echo chambers, we all do, and we all think about things and the same ideas. What it's good to do is get outside people, people who are not, who haven't been looking at the same thing for a year or two, to say, you know what, this, this makes sense, but have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And that's really why the peer review process is so important. So when you don't have the peer review process, you lose out on that. And there could be situations where you're seeing something that is, quote, published or at least pre-printed that's not published, that's giving you an idea that really hasn't gone through that filter. So realize that when you haven't gone through the filter, you may be getting stuff that um, that that may be misleading or incorrect. Mm. No, I agree completely. I mean, we have the expression sometimes you can't see the wood for the trees when you're actually in something. Um, very often you, you can you can miss the obvious. And we we have another principle here. Uh, it's sometimes called the tea lady principle. No, no uh, degradation of tea ladies, but what what it means is you could have an expert team who are working away on something, and, and they're so into it, and and they're they're not seeing the totality of the picture. Then someone comes in with a cup of tea who's not connected with the project, and uh, you say to them, well, what do you think? And they say, well, why don't you turn it upside down? You know, or something you know something basic like that. And they do that, and then the experts say, oh yeah, maybe that works. So, you know, we really need to, the, the, as Roger said, that the, the more heads that are involved in this, the better. And that, to me, that involves uh, expert heads, of course, which is what peer review does. But it also it involves this kind of common sense review, which is important as well. But for a preprint paper, um, we do need these at the moment because things are changing so quickly. And, and we've got to remember that, that human suffering and death is the, is the consequence of doing nothing very often. But there again, we have to have good rationales for our, for our interventions. So what, what I tend to do looking at a preprint paper is very often it will have been internally reviewed by a particular institution. And if that institution is of, of good quality, then I, I tend to think, well, that this peer reviewed is not peer reviewed yet, not yet, but it's been reviewed internally by the institution that therefore it's probably not too bad. But as well as that, you've just got to put your own interpretation on it. Does it make sense to you? Does this seem to be following the basic science? Because 
you know, if basic scientific principles are contradicted, then there's probably something wrong there. You know, if a paper comes out showing that homeopathy is an effective treatment, I would think, well, I'm not sure that's consistent with the basic science and that, and that would be a problem. Yeah, I was just going to add to that, too. I mean, look at look at the situation that we're in right now. We've got um, the FDA is approving things for COVID-19 on an emergency use authorization mm. basis. And mm. that that tells you everything that you need to know is they're willing to lower that bar. For instance, um, convalescent plasma was approved mm. without a control group. And uh, we, we have that today. And um, so the, the question is, and obviously that wasn't a randomized controlled trial. There was no control. So the, 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 uh, the people in the ivory towers, as we like to call them, um, they understand this. They understand that there's a pandemic and that the, the risk of not doing something is that people continue to die. But the risk of doing something risky is that more people uh, uh, die as well. And so there has to be struck a very fine balance about how much evidence are you willing, how much evidence integrity are you willing to let go to get something out there faster so that it can help more people? Mm. Yeah, any treatment is always a risk benefit analysis, isn't it? Any treatment that's going to work or any surgery that's going to work has got the possibility of side effects because it's having a, a physiological stroke or anatomical intervention on the human body. So there's always that, always that risk, of, risk of side effects. But while there's that risk benefit analysis, I always feel very, very strongly that, you know, the first principle, the, 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 the Hippocrates way back in ancient Greece, you know, first do no harm. Yeah. So if, if someone comes to me and this has happened many, many times, people have come to me for help and I've been un unable to help. And that, that, that's a pity, but, but that, that, that happens. But if someone comes to me and I do harm, then that is really quite unconscionable. And um, I don't know about, I mean, it's not the sort of thing you might talk about publicly, but I, I could give you some instances where people have actually been worse off because I, I've treated it. And that is a really bad, it's a bad, it's a bad, bad feeling. So we have to balance that, the risk benefit analysis, but we really don't want to, to, to cause someone harm by a clinical intervention. Right, exactly. I, I'm reminded of a, of a professor of mine in oncology saying, you know, Roger, the, they, they used to say, don't just stand there, do something. Well, sometimes yeah. it's actually don't just do something, stand there. Absolutely. And that's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been in a few first aid situations. And as a professional uh, who's done trauma training in a first aid situation, very often my role as the professional is to stop first aiders doing first aid, you know, because the interventions would be potentially harmful and, you know, you don't want people moving unconscious patients. First aiders have learned first aid, so they feel they have to do it. And 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 even professionals can be in that situation. As Roger said, very often the best thing to do is nothing, or at least wait until we're sure what to do. I want to ask a quick question on following the advice of our uh, national institutions, whether it's the CDC or FDA here in the United mm -hmm. States. I assume it's the National Health Service and in the UK. Yeah, yeah. The, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence and yeah, perfect. Um, mm. These institutions, uh, of course, have great scientists in them. They're, they've also been wrong on occasion. This has been a, an evolving pandemic, and they've made recommendations mm. that have been later revised. Um, they've been slow to make certain recommendations. Um, how can people um, have their trust uh, restored or maintained in these organizations? And I'll start with you, Dr. Campbell. Yeah, well... We, we need these organizations because we, we do need a national guideline because otherwise, you know, we, we do tend to have uh, anarchy and we, we don't want that. So they've, they've, in, they've introduced these guidelines and OK, they haven't always always been 100 percent correct. But all we can ever do, I mean, when, when Roger goes into to practice uh, clinic, clinical medicine, it would be nice if he could use research findings that were found out next year and the year after and the year after. But of course, he can't. You know, you know, you you can only go by what you know now, and current knowledge is always, always going to be limited. So, as individuals and and these groupings, they they made decisions based on the best available knowledge now, and really that that is all you can do. The the key thing is is to modify it or to change it or even to repeal it, as new knowledge comes along. Because all we know is what we know now. Insight into the future would be pretty wonderful, but you know we haven't, we we, we can't do that yet. 
What do you think? Yeah, and I would say this, everybody makes mistakes. That's not in question. Everybody gets things wrong. What really stands out and makes people different in my mind is the willingness and open-mindedness to accept mm -hmm. their mistakes and change their behavior once they find that out. And so to me, seeing, seeing the fact that these organizations have changed their stance is not a black mark on their reputation, but rather one that's showing that the science is working, that the process is working, and that people are updating what their recommendations are. I, I think that it's our job to educate the public that that's the case. When they see things changing, that's a good sign. That means that they're looking at the science, they're looking at the data, and they're coming up with a different plan than the, the worst case scenario would be to get something wrong and, and be obstinate and not change. That would be the worst case scenario. Uh, there's no way you're going to ever have perfection and understand perfectly what it is that happens. I mean, look at look at the example of um, of estrogen replacement therapy. We had all of the studies that seen the show retrospectively that it was a good idea to replace all women with estrogen replacement after menopause. And uh, with the Women's Health Study publication in 2002, when it showed that it actually increased the incidence of strokes, we made a reversal, we switched. Uh, now there's been some uh, you know, criticism and controversy that maybe uh, if you keep women on estrogen replacement immediately after menopause, that you don't get some of those side effects. And, and that can be debated. But the, the point is, is that when the studies were done, they made an about face and they changed their behavior. Once we found out that um, masks seemed to help, the recommendation initially was that masks didn't help. And we made that switch. You know, initially the recommendation was to stay away from steroids. But the mm -hmm. UK recovery trial proved that beyond a shadow of a doubt to be the wrong stance. And we've now dexamethasone is the cornerstone of treatment in COVID-19. So, so I think that's good. The fact that things are changing shows that we're willing to adapt, we're willing to accept the science. Mm. And the human body is, is essentially infinitely complicated. <laughs> we, we, we'll never understand it. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, maybe Roger could tell me how consciousness is generated, but I haven't got a clue. <laughs> you know, and, and these are such fundamental things that we really don't know. I mean, the complexity inside a single cell is, is completely beyond comprehension, the way these molecular machines work. So we're, we're always going to be on a journey. We're always going to be progressing. Um, but I guess that's what keeps us keeps us on our toes and keeps it interesting. <laughs> Dr. Schwell, you mentioned uh, steroids, dexamethasone, and I want to read a question from a viewer word for word because I think it's a great question. Have there been any new promising treatments besides steroids and remdesivir? And the second part of the question is, are doctors giving <clears throat> vitamin D to inpatients now? So I'll turn that over to you, Dr. Schwell. Yeah, so let, I love to talk about vitamin D, especially since we've got uh, Dr. Campbell here, uh, John. Um, so I think there's probably no treatment modality, and John can can uh, weigh in on this too. Other other than dexamethasone, there really hasn't been any other treatment modality that has been studied as rigorously and has shown that steroids work. I mean, there's been a meta-analysis with different steroids. Dexamethasone probably has the best number needed to treat. And, and, and particularly, it works best late in the course. So that's another, that's another thing I think that we've Fine. found out the, the most, uh, going back to your very first question, what are some of the lessons learned? The lesson that I've learned uh, in terms of this is that COVID-19 is a two-part disease. There's an early course where certain things seem to work very well, and there's a, a late course where other things seem to work well, and those things that worked well early don't work well late. Dexamethasone are, is one of those uh, uh, treatments that works very well late in the course, but doesn't seem to work very well early in the course, and that has to do with what's going on pathophysiologically. We, uh, very early on, I believe there's a suppression of the immune system, the innate immune system, suppression of, of interferon response, and the key there at the early part of the course is to, is to enhance immunity and to help out the immune system. Whereas later in the course, when the adaptive immune system kicks in and there's a cytokine storm and pneumonia, it's to suppress the immune system. I think dexamethasone is probably one of the best things for that. That's dexamethasone. In terms of remdesivir, you know, that's, that's kind of a tale of two cities there. Um, we've got American randomized controlled trial data that shows that, that uh, remdesivir works early in the course. But then you've got this WHO trial. What do you do with the data there? That shows that really it didn't help at all. 
Um, but again, that was a little bit more later in the course. The real question, though, that you ask is, is there anything else? Uh, vitamin D. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to I'll, I'll let John talk about vitamin D first, since he was uh, one of the first people on this back in February. Um, but I, I certainly have a lot to say about vitamin D. But I, I really haven't seen anything yet emerge other than monoclonal antibodies early in the course in terms of the data that we have, randomized controlled data. So that would be, I think, an, another topic that we can talk about is getting people early in the course of the disease who are positive, who are at risk factors for, have risk factors for progression to get monoclonal antibodies. And there's a couple of options out there, but I've already said a lot. I'll, I'll hand it to John. Mm. No, I agree completely, Roger. The, 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 time, the time criticality of, of the interventions are clear. I think you did a video recently on, on the monoclonal antibody therapy, that it has to be given early before the virus kind of gets into the cell. So that, that you know, the earlier that is given, the better. But we know we know that steroids are massively anti-inflammatory. They will just stop inflammatory processes. They're very powerful drugs. And, and the immune response is, is tied in with that inflammatory response. So to give steroids when we have an active uh, viral disease would, would be contraindicated. It's exactly what we don't want to do. And, and yet and yet, as Roger says, later on in the course, where we're dealing with the, the body's, what is essentially an immunological stroke or autoimmune reaction almost to, to the virus, then it's essential to damp that down. So the alveoli don't fill up with these, these inflammatory fluids. Absolutely time critical. And the vitamin D one, of course, is very interesting. Now, the Spanish study that, that both of us have covered, um, they, they, they gave calcifidiol, didn't they, which was the active form of vitamin d so so when i take my vitamin d3 tablets it's going to take days to a week to convert that into the active form so really the time to be taking vitamin d is when you're healthy when someone becomes ill if we give them vitamin d2 or vitamin d3 that's not going to build up into the active form the calcifidiol in the blood for, for some days or even a week and, and by that time the disease can uh, can have pro progressed so it's Given the calcifidiol, as, as the Spanish study did, they're giving the active form already. So again, they're kind of cutting out a few days of time. So, so the, the, this time criticality is, is really vital. And it would be so nice if we had very broad spectrum, very effective antiviral drugs. But I'm afraid it's a major failure of human progress so far that we don't have such a thing. We have them for, anti for bacterial infections, for antibiotics, but... Viruses are complicated and we don't have good antiviral. For some things we, we, we have, like herpes simplex, we have antiviral treatments for that. But, but, um, but generic antivirals, I'm afraid we are still, still uh, struggling on towards that and we're not there yet by any means. But the monoclonal antibodies are, are very promising. A lot of people have asked about ivermectin and, uh, and wondered if this could be a potential therapeutic um, that you know, wondering about the evidence so far for it. And the second part of the question is, should um, organizations and even governments look into this medication as a potential? And so I'll start with you, Dr. Schwelt, on this question. Yeah, so, so we covered ivermectin fairly early, many months ago, and it was very preliminary. And um, we, we mentioned that there was some, uh, you know, some possibility about ivermectin working. I think at the time, the preponderant theory was that ivermectin somehow inhibited proteins from going into the nucleus and, and causing um, the immune system to be shut down. I think the, 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 current, the current thinking is, and, and what sort of woke us up to this ivermectin was the uh, Senate, the United States Senate hearing where Dr. Corey uh, gave a testimony that group that's looking into ivermectin, that's uh, Paul Merrick's group out of uh, Eastern Virginia Medical School and the, uh, the, the, uh, the group that they've put together, believe that ivermectin works in a completely different manner. It actually blocks the ability of the virus from hitting the ACE2 receptor, almost like a monoclonal antibody. And so they believe that this may be beneficial in preventing and also in treating early um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 infection. So there's a number of studies that have looked at this. Let's talk about you know, the, the, the research for this. Th what I would like to see, and, and I'm sure John as well, would be a large randomized controlled trial, multi-center, that's peer-reviewed and published 
and is, is conducted in the country where you want to actually have the treatment because populations around the world are different. And, you know, one of the things that we're seeing with this is there's, there is randomized controlled trial data. Um, some of them are up to two, three, 400 in size, which is good, uh, but it hasn't been peer reviewed, hasn't been published as far as I can see. And the, the data is showing that, and, and these populations have, by the way, a higher incidence of parasitic infections. And so they're not exactly the same populations we see in the United States. The other, the other uh, interesting aspect about this too is that the mortality, at least in the United States, is higher than in some of these countries uh, where they're doing this. Um, and so a lot of these studies where I'm looking at, the mortality in, in both arms are very, very low. Um, and so it's, it's hard to parse out. That enough to say is if we look at what the group that has raised awareness of ivermectin, I think ivermectin is, if boy, if it works, it will be, uh, it will be amazing. So I'm hoping that it works. If you look at that group that's brought it up, what they're asking for, which I think is perfectly reasonable, is for the NIH to look at the data to figure out what needs to be done to move forward so that this could be potentially uh, available in the United States. Look, it, ivermectin either works or it doesn't work. And it doesn't matter who says it works or who doesn't say it works. It either works or it doesn't. And we know how to figure that out. We do that by large, multi-center, randomized controlled trials. And I think that's what needs to happen. The good news is, is that I did see that there is a randomized controlled trial that's currently undergoing uh, a trial in uh, at Temple University in, uh, in Philadelphia. I don't know when that's going to be completed or when we're going to have results on that. But I'm hoping that that happens fairly soon. And look, you know, the people that are proposing this aren't quacks. These are, are well-respected um, acad <clears throat> academics that have been working in critical care for quite a long time and have published a number of papers. What we need to do is be, have an open mind, take it seriously. But again, remember that there are potential side effects in giving ivermectin. So we have to make sure that, that what we're doing is, is good and responsible. Mm. Yeah, the, the idea of having a drug which is, is relatively inexpensive uh, which has got a, a known safety profile, which is generic. It can be people can make it in very large amounts without without any uh, copyright issues on the drug. It, it is a great idea, and that's what happened with steroids. Of course, these drugs are readily and freely available. We, we now know how to use them. It just seems a pity to me that drugs like ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine have got tangled up in 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 politics to some extent, and, and I mean politics with a small p there, not really party politics. So um, it's, it's one of the things that we're actually not entirely free to talk about at the moment because, um, you know, you know, it's uh, it, it, there's, there's a lot of emotion around about it and there's a huge amount of disinformation around about it. Now, as Roger said, the people proposing this are, are very high quality people. So I, I spent an evening looking at it and I, I read their information and when you and it all did kind of make sense. But when you actually look back to try and get the original trial data, as Roger said, I, I was really quite frustrated. So a study in Bangladesh, for example, that seemed to show efficacy, but we've got a, a different age profile there. We've got a different level of parasitic disease. We've got we've got malaria. We've got we've got so many other things that, that could be confusing the picture. So I, I'm not sure we can really take too much from that. So I didn't really find any uh, clinical trial that I felt I could report on reliably so all i can say at the moment is we don't really know it's an interesting possibility if it works i i, I would be i would be absolutely delighted the same as roger because people know how to use it it's relatively inexpensive it's available all over the world it's on it's on the world health organization list of essential drugs but that's for treating parasitic disease of course this is a uh, this is relabeling, repurposing. so the the bottom the bottom line to that question carl at the moment is, is we don't really know so I think I know the answer to this, but just to clarify, you both have heard about reports of patients um, either attaining ivermectin to take it prophylactically for COVID-19 or even attaining the veterinary form of ivermectin, yeah. you know, horse, horse paste. Um, I imagine neither of you think that's a, a wise idea at this point with ivermectin. Do, do, do nothing, do take nothing that your own doctor does not prescribe. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's as simple as that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. 
I want to move on to the um, the recent mutation that uh, Dr. Campbell, mm -hmm. you're you're in the thick of this in the UK, and and certainly it's yeah. popped up here in the United States, and it's probably more widespread than than we know mm -hmm. at this point. Um, but tell us your perspective on this mutation, and specifically, there's concern from folks that will this make the vaccine less effective? Will it make mm -hmm. testing less effective? Could it even make yeah. the treatments, the few very few treatments that we have, less effective? Mm -hmm. So, so th this is a mutation. The virus is mutating all the time, of course. So really, it's a variant. And there's actually a, there's a cluster of mutations that tend to go together. So th there's a deletion of the amino acid 69 and 70, I think it is. And it's B501Y. So th there's a change in an amino acid. And this cluster tends to go together. But it's now... There's evidence now. We now know, I think we can say we now know, this form is more transmissible. And it looks like from the data we have, it's about 55% more transmissible. And what that means is that the level of uh, interventions we were taking to prevent the spread of the disease that were working uh, are now no longer sufficient because we're dealing with a more transmissible disease. So to keep that R value below one, we have to be taking now more rigorous precautions than they were before because of the increased transmissibility. Now, the data we have from Public Health England shows definitely it's more transmissible, but it's not showing it's making people sicker, which is a good thing. Now, there is some question mark at the moment, and we don't know this yet. There's an intimation in the data that it may be increasing the infectiousness and how quickly the disease is spreading through younger people. Uh, basically talking about the teenager group, the, the, the under 20 group, that there is some very, very early intimations that it might be making that younger group sicker. But we have no firm evidence on that yet, because what we've what we've found in the course of this pandemic over the past few months is that there's been increased incidence in a particular demographic in, in younger people or older people. And it, it's been at different times. So this could be a coincidence. But that's my main concern at the moment, that this is more transmissible. And is it affecting younger people more? We don't really know yet. Now, in terms of the vaccine and indeed in terms of reinfection. So we've actually done studies in the UK. Public Health England have done retrospective analysis on this. And they've looked at people that have definitely been infected. Uh, and th they're looking at how many people get reinfected. And there's a very small proportion of people do get reinfected. It's a very small proportion. Nearly all have asymptomatic illness, but that proportion is there. It's perhaps le less than one in a thousand. It's a very small amount. And it's been shown that with th this new new mutation, it's no more likely to cause reinfection than the old th than, than the old form of the virus. So what it's looking like is when people make immunity to the virus, that immunity is active against the old form of the virus and this new variant of the virus. The immunity is what we would call cross immunity. It's working for both types. And the other thing about this is the, the, the protein structure of the virus, what we call the proteome of the virus. This new mutation has changed less than 1% of actually the protein structure in the virus. That means 99% of the protein structure in the virus is the same as it was. And of course, the immune system is primarily learning to recognize these foreign proteins. So even if it can't recognize that 1% of the foreign protein, it makes sense that it can recognize the other 99%. And that is what's happening, that people aren't getting reinfected at a higher rate. And from that, it is very rational, very reasonable to extrapolate that the vaccines will also work. Because if the, 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 vac the vaccine, if we take the Oxford vaccine, for example, it's not, it's not producing one antibody. It's a polyclonal response. It's producing many different types of antibodies and it's inducing natural killer cell activity, the NK cell activity, the large lymphocytes. Now, we used to think that they were nonspecific, but it is, we have recent data now that shows that they are specific and they can be alerted to the presence of a particular type of virus. The vaccines are also stimulating the, the small lymphocytes, the T cells and the B cells the cytotoxic T cells that will kill virally infected cells, the, the B cells that will make the antibodies. And it's also stimulating what we call the phagocytic cells. These are the cells that eat viral particles and eat virally infected cells, that the macrophages and the neutrophils are also stimulated. So the immune response is not simple. It's, it's, it's um, the, the immune system is attacking from this way and this way and this way and this way. And um, 
the, the, the idea that such a basically a simple mutation and a simple change in the proteome would dramatically affect that is not really uh, a worry at the moment. So I'm more than happy that the current vaccines will work. And even even if there was a big shift, the vaccine manufacturers can change the uh, the configuration of the vaccine for the RNA um for, for the messenger RNA vaccines quite readily and, and also for the viral vector type vaccines, the Oxford type vaccine could be changed if it needs to, but it doesn't at the moment. So I'm not worried about that. Va vaccination is still our way out of this. Dr. Schwal, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think John answered that uh, uh, better than I, <laughs> I mean, that he, he answered all of the points. He hit on all of the points that I think are, are relevant to that question. Excellent. Well, let's move on to to vaccines then specifically. And uh, Dr. Schwell, you've you've had the vaccine. Um, the uh, the Pfizer vaccine was offered at your your hospital, and um, you were able to get that. What was it? Two weeks ago now, your first dose. Yeah, about a little over two weeks. So the question is, um, how concerned are you uh, both about the reports of allergies uh, in some people that have gotten vaccinated? Um, short-term side effects, long-term side effects, just the overall safety and efficacy of these vaccines? Yeah, so I think uh, if we add up all of the uh, the media <laughs> accounts, I think that's a very accurate way of, of finding out uh, how many allergic reactions there are, because you know that every allergic reaction is going to be in the media. Um, we're probably less than a one in 100,000 at this point. And, you know, if you were to be giving out a, a big campaign of giving out peanuts, I think we probably have more allergic reactions to that than we would to the to the vaccine. So this is completely reasonable. This is completely with what I would expect there to be. Um, what we're going to see, and I, I want to get people ready for this, is uh, in about a month or so, maybe about a couple of weeks, we're going to start to see people completing their second shot. And then seven days after that, we'll then have, quote unquote, Im immunity based on the studies that we've been looking at. And then now get ready, because there are going to be people that are going to be coming down with COVID-19 even after mm -hmm. the vaccine. And, and why is that? Because it's not 100 percent effective. It's 95 percent effective. That means 5 percent of the people or, or yeah, 5 percent of the people that get vaccinated will potentially still be able to get coronavirus or, or COVID-19. And so don't let that scare you into saying, well, look, the vaccine is um, is not uh, efficacious. It's not worth getting. Just like don't worry about these allergic reactions that you shouldn't get it because uh, people are getting allergic reactions. Look, the, 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 you have to look in the population and compare it to the population. Anytime you put a foreign substance, anything into somebody, uh, you're going to get a, the potential of an allergic reaction. So just be prepared. Put it in context. Put it, look at the numbers. Make sense of the numbers. And, and, and think about this rationally, that uh, nothing is 100 percent. The point here is, is that we're trying to reduce the number of, uh, of COVID-19. There's good data that the RNA vaccines, both at least we have data in Moderna, but probably also related to the uh, Pfizer vaccine and probably also the Oxford. In fact, we do have data in the Oxford vaccine that shows that vaccination not only reduces COVID-19, but also reduces infectivity. Mm. The, the encouraging thing about the vaccines is, and we, we, with the Oxford vaccine so far, it's looking like it's 95% or higher that people who have had one dose of the vaccine, even though they can become infected, don't get sick. And this is the key thing. We need to stop people getting sick and keep them out of hospitals. So in, in, the, in the Oxford trial, no one who'd had the first dose of the vaccine went on to be hospitalized. And that is remarkably encouraging. And with the Pfizer, it's looking like about 90 percent of people after the first dose don't get sick. So, again, you've got to think about the protection against infection in absolute terms, which, of course, we want. But we've got to think about the uh, the protection from getting sick if we do get infected. And for both of them, that's looking quite promising, which is why the UK has gone on to this one uh, one one shot regime to try and vaccinate as many people as, as we can, and 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 Roger's absolutely right. If you hear if someone has an anaphylactic reaction, you're bound to hear about it. It's the the, new, the news is going to pick that up. Now the 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 Moderna uh, the Moderna and the uh, the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, people will know that this is based on a single strand of RNA, but RNA is basically water soluble, so it won't get into the cells. So it's necessary to surround that with a 
a lipid based uh, capsule. So e each piece of messenger RNA is in this lipid based uh, capsule. And the lipid based capsule is actually different between the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine. So the lipid based capsule for the Pfizer vaccine, for example, needs to be kept at what is it, minus 70, 80 degrees centigrade. Whereas for the Moderna vaccine, that lipid capsule only needs to be kept at about minus 20 degrees centigrade. That, that's where the difference comes in. And that there, there is a, a, like a chemical configuration in, in the uh, vaccine of this lipid coat. And it could be that one of those components is causing the allergic reaction. And the manufacturers are going to be able to take that out. But having said that, the people that I have heard of of having the allergic reactions are, are predisposed to having allergic reactions. We call these people atopic. They have allergic reactions to quite a to quite a few things. They produce these immunoglobulin type piece to things that they're not supposed to produce them to. And they carry EpiPens already. So these people know that. So, so for people that are prone to allergic reactions to have a very small incidence of allergic reactions, it doesn't surprise me at all. And it doesn't really concern me because these people know if they're getting vaccinated to get vaccinated in hospital. So I, I have no history of allergies, so I'd be quite happy to get vaccinated in a in a sports centre, for example, in a mass vaccination campaign. But for people that are prone to allergic disease, we would vaccinate them in hospital. And if people have these allergic reactions in hospital, we are very good at treating them. They, 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 they are eminently treatable. And um, OK, the person might feel pretty bad for a short period of time. But uh, in the vast majority of cases, they're going to be absolutely fine because we give the appropriate treatments. So as Roger said, one in 100,000 allergies doesn't surprise me at all, doesn't concern me. What is a pity is that the media pick up on this. And th this, is, this is ammunition to, to, to the anti-vaxxers campaign. But, but uh, as someone who's been giving drugs and vaccines for many, many years now, it doesn't surprise me, it doesn't concern me at all, to be quite honest. Yeah, yeah, Kyle, I would just add that, uh, you know, people who get penicillin shots, it's one mm. in 8,000 that gets mm. an allergic reaction. Uh, according to the current data here, it's one in 100,000 for the vaccine. If yeah. only the media would publish the 12 times that uh, somebody got an allergic reaction from a penicillin shot, uh, than they did from a uh, vaccination shot, then we would pe have people being anti-antibiotic. Mm. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. H headline, uh, vaccine causes 12 times less allergic reactions than <laughs> an antibiotic. That's I mean, the headline we need as, to see. as you said, Roger, peanuts. I mean, yeah. it's about one in 70, one in 80 kids in the UK have, have a level of, level of allergy against against nuts. It's, it's, it's really high. Um, or, or the simple non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, the, the ibuprofen and things yeah. like that, they, they have a very high incidence, of normal aspirin. As a pretty high incidence of, of allergic reaction. So the, the, the latex gloves, uh, you know, people, are, I'm sure there's more people allergic to latex than there is to the new vaccine. Yeah. What would you say to someone? I mean, you, you guys both mentioned how rare uh, allergic reactions are with these vaccines and, and putting them in context with other things like penicillin. Uh, what would you say to someone that says, well, you know, that's fine. It's only a hundred, one in a hundred thousand or so that get an allergic reaction. But I don't know about long-term side effects with these vaccines. And I also, um, you know, I take really good care of myself. I have a strong immune system. I don't get sick often. Um, why, why should I get the vaccine? If I get sick with COVID-19, I'll just let my own immune system fight it off. What would you say to that question? I'll start with you, Dr. Campbell, on this one. Well, you, you just never know if you're the one that's going to get sick. You know, I, I've, I've met so many people who said, well, I can't I don't know why this happened to me. But, 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 but it does. That's the nature of disease. It does happen to people. And although we have recognized comorbidities, increasing severity with age, increasing severity with other comorbidities, that's on a population level. You know, if I get infected, although I have no particular comorbidities, I don't know if it's going to kill me or not. You know, there's always that possibility. We, we can't predict all of these things. And it, it's like this risk benefit analysis again, isn't it? You know, I, I'm pretty happy with the safety of the vaccines. I'm more than happy to get that. Uh, I don't really want to get this disease because there's maybe a 2% chance, 3% chance it's going to kill me. That, 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 that chance is always there. And as well as that, the thing with the vaccine is even if, even if you could guarantee, which of course you never can, if you could guarantee I'm going to be safe, am I going to pass it on to other people? There's this social responsibility. 
So vaccines for me are just this win-win situation. It protects me, which I'm pretty happy about, but it also protects those around me and contributes towards herd immunity. So it's a win-win situation. That's, I, I, I'm so jealous of Roger having had his. I really am. <laughs> I haven't had mine yet. I'm really looking forward to it. Anything well, to I add? hope you get it soon. Um, I'm supposed <laughs> to be getting my second shot later this week, and I heard the second shot's a little worse, so we'll see how it goes. It kind of makes sense because you've already developed some immunity to that, and then yeah. when you introduce the antigen again, you're going to get more of an inflammatory reaction, and as you know, the inflammatory reaction can be localized, but you also get this systemic inflammatory reaction, which is what makes you feel bad. Right. So, um, but, you know, okay, you need to book a day off work, you know, to, and just take it easy for a day or two after the vaccine. That is a, a price well worth paying. Yeah, I agree. For, for not getting this disease, taking away the risk of dying and taking away you as someone who could potentially spread it to someone else. It's a, to me, it's a small price to pay and I'm more than happy to pay it. Yeah, I, Kyle, I totally agree with, uh, with John's assessment there of that question. I don't really have much to add. I absolutely the same points. Another potential consequence of COVID-19, I mean, Dr. Campbell, you mentioned the risk of, of course, dying or, or having a severe infection. Mm. Another potential risk is uh, this, this long COVID sy syndrome or long yeah. haulers. And yeah. so I'm curious yeah. what both of your thoughts are uh, about that. But certainly people that have experienced that are, um, have been, some of them have been very vocal. You know, we, we need more um, recognition mm. for this mm. and, and more awareness around uh, the post-COVID infection effects. So I'll start with you, Dr. Schwell, just general thoughts on that. Well, they're absolutely right. We do need more, and we are getting more information because as this pandemic goes on, that information is going to come in. A, a lot of people see this as a, as a black and white issue. You're either dead or you're not. And unfortunately, it's not that way. It's a gradient. There are people who are who've survived it, who are, who are alive, and yet are experiencing daily uh, debilitating symptoms. Uh, the recent study came out showing that in, in healthy athletes who have come down with the COVID-19 and, and recovered, 60% of them had signs of myocarditis or infl inflammation of the, of the heart tissue. That's very concerning. It's concerning to me in terms of what, what are we going to see down the line? We all remember way back learning about in in uh, in school about uh, these people who had infections never got antibiotics and started to to get um uh, con conditions of uh, rheumatic heart disease mm -hmm. mitral stenosis and we don't see that anymore because we have antibiotics but what are we going to see now because of this this post inflammatory type of syndrome we don't have the answer to that uh, what i suspect is going on is that when you get infected with the virus you know, the immune system is is ripping it apart and presenting different antigens and epitopes to your immune system, different parts, different body parts, if you will, of the virus. And that is going to generate a, a wide and broad antibody and immune response against many epitopes. When that happens, the chances of you getting an autoimmune condition like Guillain-Barre, like narcolepsy, things that have happened before uh, in, in uh, post-viral states, goes up. Whereas if you get the vaccination, you're getting a very specific epitope, very specific protein, and you're making a very specific response against that virus. It seems to me that the that the, the chances of getting a post-vaccination issue is going to be smaller than getting a post-infectious viral uh, syndrome. Mm -hmm. I, th I think I think the whole issue of post-viral syndromes and post-viral fatigue is is under recognized. Um, I, I, I know two or three people just from from personal contacts who have never been quite right from viral infections from from quite a long time ago. I mean, Roger said something there that really concerns me, actually. He mentioned myocarditis and this is inflammation of the myocardium, the heart muscle itself. And if people have that, it's absolutely essential that they rest. So if people are not recovered from this illness, it really is important, I think, that they don't go and play squash, they don't go jogging, they don't go out cycling. They really take it easy until the doctors are very happy that they've made a good recovery. I've actually seen people who've had relatively minor viral infections go out, do some vigorous exercise, and they've gone into fatal, uh, fatal cardiac dysrhythmias. That, that, that can happen. So post-viral syndromes are under, underrated anyway. Now, I think, I think it's going to turn out to be two types. There's going to be this specific 
post-COVID syndrome, which I'm hopeful is going to resolve. Now, there is studies on this. You know, more people resolve after three months than one month. month, month. People do get gradually better over time. But what, what is really concerning is in some people, the virus is going to damage tissues. And if you damage like heart muscle tissue, uh, if you if you damage the structure of the lungs, if you, if you damage the structure of the kidneys, then the ability of those organs to, to recover is limited if the actual architecture of those organs is damaged. So there could be a residual long term organ damage from that. And we don't know that yet. So in the United Kingdom, the health service is actually recruiting in combination with academics, a group of 60,000 people that, that are currently being followed up and are going to be followed up long term. And they're going to be seen regularly at clinics. So there's going to be a, a long COVID follow up program in the UK. So data will be forthcoming on that. But I'm hopeful that most of the people that get this fatigue get the prolonged fever. Um, a, a very common report that, that people have, have, have given to me is, is they get very fast heart rate. Uh, the heart rate goes up to about 130, 140 with e even very minor exercise. I'm hopeful that will resolve over a period of time, but we could well have this core of people that, that, that are left with long term uh, damage. And we have seen this in previous pandemics. The, this did happen somewhat after the um, after the 1918 pandemic. The, the, there was a condition called uh, post encephalitic Parkinsonism where people were left with damage to the, to the basal ganglia of the brain and uh, long life Parkinsonism as a result of the acute viral infection caused by caused by actual tissue damage. Um, so we're just hoping that this is going to be small, but we can't put numbers on it yet. One, yeah, and I, I just I was just going to add, Kyle, I mean, that doesn't say that the, that doesn't mean that there aren't long term complications to the vaccine, which I think gets back mm. to the original question. Um, mm. But Generally speaking, and if you look back, there have been long term complications from from vaccines in general. If you look at um, uh, narcolepsy, for instance, mm. it was uh, was one of the issues back in the vaccination for the flu back in 2009. Um, but usually we see those things within a few months of a mm. vaccination. So it's not like we're going to be having to wait two to five years to see the results of that. We usually see those pretty pretty quickly. And so I think we should have some data on that. Once that goes, there really isn't a reason. And, and again, you're not. it's not like you're choosing between complete normal health and taking a vaccine, which may have complications. You're choosing between, in a pandemic, having the post-viral effects of getting the virus versus the post effects of getting the vaccine. Mm. And I know which I'd choose. I'd go with the vaccine risk rather than the infection yeah. risk. That is for sure. No, I, I agree completely. The, the, the idea that something is going to drop out of the ceiling in 18 months time and hit us when we weren't expecting it. I think the chances of that are pretty close to zero. And to your point, Dr. Schwell, I think it's important to also point out some of these complications um, or side effects that arise um, during a trial, during a vaccine trial, like Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a scary thing. You know, it's a, it's a nerve syndrome where there's, there's a temporary paralysis potentially or worse. But comparing, the importance of comparing that to also background. How many people experience something like that, Guillain-Barre mm -hmm. or Bell's palsy without a vaccine or, or with a, 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 a typical infection? So I think that's something, again, from, from my vantage point, that's lost with media reports. It's like, hey, look, this person got, was in the, the vaccine arm of a trial, and they got this Bell's palsy, this facial paralysis. But turns out there's a proportion of people that get that regardless. That's the, you know, we call that background. And uh, sometimes that's lost in these news reports. We had this with the MMR a few years ago in the UK. People were saying there was autism after the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. And there was a report on the news where, where a child had had the MMR vaccine. They went to visit him next month and he developed autism. You know, they took one case completely out of context. You know, it turns out there is no correlation here at all. This was completely bogus science. And uh, I mean, for, for example, in, in the Oxford vaccine, when they were doing the trials in Brazil, uh, there was actually three deaths from trauma. There, there was one person was actually murdered. One died in a road traffic accident and, and, and one died from from blunt trauma to the head. And, and of course, that's nothing to do, nothing to do with the vaccine at all. It's just 
if you're taking large numbers of people, that, that then things can happen. You know, li- living human life is dangerous. It's not risk free. Right. There's one thing I wanted to point out about that um, myocarditis study that you you mentioned, Dr. Schwelt. Um, one potential limitation, just for people to be aware of, from my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Schwelt, is that that study looked at athletes, but there wasn't really, they didn't have a before and after for them. So there was some concern, maybe the, car, the radiologist overread uh, a potential myocarditis there. So there wasn't a true control group, but um, just something for people to look into, I think. And, and, that, and that's the purpose of uh, peer review and, and critical appraisal, absolutely. But again, we're gonna have more data that's gonna come out. It's gonna be, if this causes significant long-term comorbidities, we're going to find out about it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think there is some pathological data, unfortunate, from post-mortem studies. That, yeah. that, that, does, that does show the virus has directly damaged the lungs, um, the, the myocardium, uh, the, the, the brain and the kidneys. I'm, I think there's, there's post-mortem data on that now, but we're just hoping. But of course, the post-mortem data, thankfully, is self-selecting data. These are the people that had most severe disease. We don't do post-mortems on the, on the vast majority of people that thankfully survived. Right. So so we don't have that data yet, but we know what we're saying is we know this tissue damage can happen. We just right. believe it to be at a very low rate. Absolutely. Well, neither of you are in the business of predicting the future, um, but as, as we're in a new year now and we're, we're looking ahead and there's a, you know, for some people, maybe a sense of hope uh, that we made it through the year 2020 um, what do you anticipate over the next three months, six months, over the next year? Um, what are what are some of your predictions as you look ahead for how things will go with this pandemic? And the second part of the question is, um, do you anticipate another pandemic coming down the pike? Do you think this is something that's going to happen, unfortunately, more mm-hmm. more frequently? I'll start with you, Dr. Schwelt, on this one. Well, I think that right now that the, the the spike that we're going through is going to eventually subside. I'm hoping in February or March for a couple of reasons. Number one, we're not having as many uh, get togethers, uh, uh, holiday get togethers as, as we have had in the last month or two. And, and number two, you know, as as John is a believer, I'm a believer that vitamin D is actually playing a role in this. And as the as the sun starts to come back up, to the equator and hopefully toward the uh, the tropic of cancer, uh, we're going to see more sunlight, more ultraviolet B radiation. That means more vitamin D in our bodies, and so hopefully that's going to help and and knock down the infection rate. I, I suspect that the effect of vaccination is really not going to be seen on this pandemic until we get later in the year, and and hopefully with the campaigns like we're seeing in the UK and in the United States we'll hopefully have a better uh, winter season next year if, if things pan out. Uh, I'd like to hear what John has to say, especially about where we're going to go with vitamin D um, this year. Well, you know, I go to the supermarket now from time to time when I can't avoid it. And if I go in the afternoon, the vitamin D shelf is always sold out. <laughs> so the message is getting through. Now, we, we, we're, our government is actually giving out vitamin D to vulnerable people between December and March for four months. They're going to give them a free supply. But as far as we know, they're still arguing about the dose. Now, the Scottish government's doing this, but it's only at the 400 international unit levels, which is 10 micrograms. It's, it's nothing. It's nothing. So i um, really hoping that the government are going to uh, sort of increase their thinking on that and give a realistic dose, which would probably be something like 50 micrograms, which is... 2,000 international units. And as well as that, the other big factor, as well as vitamin D, which Roger completely accurately says, of course, but people are just not ventilating enough because we don't like being cold. So when when we're in public areas, a really good idea in public areas would be to have carbon dioxide meters. And if the carbon dioxide goes up in public areas, then it's reasonable to assume that the the expired uh, droplets and aerosolized uh, water droplets in the air would also be increased. Because I go into supermarkets now and other places and really they're just not well ventilated. So as 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 the weather gets warmer, we, we ventilate more. We really need to dilute that viral load. That's what masks are doing. They're diluting the viral load. 
that's what good ventilation is doing. We'll dilute the viral load, but we're just not getting that right yet. So, so as Roger said, spring will increase ventilation, but we need to get that message out quicker. Now, as regards what's going to happen over the next few weeks in the UK, it's not good. It's not good. We have escalating cases. Um, we, we know that there was more interaction over Christmas. Uh, we know there's more cases uh, com coming down coming down the pipeline. Um, and, and we we know that, you know, two weeks after that, there's going to be people getting sick and hospitalizations. Now, hospitals in the UK are already more full than they were at the peak of the first wave in April, the 12th of April uh, 2020. We we're already beyond that point. And we've got these high infection numbers now. I think it was about 57,000 new cases per day in the UK. And we know in two weeks time, a percentage of those are going to need to be hospitalized. Uh, and it's still increasing. And the level of restriction that we're now implying, although we've got what we call tier four over many parts of the country, it's looking like that may well not be enough because of the increased transmissibility of, of this new variant. Now, with the old variant, that would have been enough. The R value would have been below one and things would be getting better. But we've got this extra complete burden uh, of this new variant now. So cases are going to get keep increasing um, for, for, for some time. And even if we get to stop the cases increasing, we've still got the hospitalizations. We've got this expression now in the UK. It's, it's baked in. So there's so many um, so, so many hospitalizations and tragically so many deaths already baked into the figures. So in the UK, for, for the forthcoming months, it's going to be really, really quite difficult. And uh, that there are going to be more cases and deaths. And uh, as I read the data in the States, it, it's it's similar. Uh, it, it varies in different parts of the States, of course, but but the, the trend is up. The, the death trend is up. And unfortunately, that's going to carry on because the herd immunity effect is not going to really kick in with any significant effect on transmission realistically until March, April, that, 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 that kind of time frame. So we just have to keep emphasizing over and over again. We need the hands, face, space, ventilate message. That's not going to go away until the the really getting towards the end of 2021, if then, if then. In terms of another pandemic, there's two views about this uh, SARS coronavirus too. Some people think it, we can eradicate it, as we did with SARS coronavirus 1 back in 2003. Other people think it's going to become endemic. My thinking is it could be with us for a few seasons. But as long as the vaccine uptake is high enough, I'm I'm pretty confident we can eradicate this virus. So, you know, we could be sitting here in five years time and, and the SARS coronavirus, too, may not exist in the wild. That, that, that is that is that's my hope. Uh, it's possible. As regards another pandemic, I've actually been teaching my students for about 30 years now. There'll be another pandemic or and not 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 that I worked that out for myself. I got that from the virologists. <laughs> you know, that they, they've always been saying this. There will be another pandemic. I'd suspected it would be a genetic shift in the in influenza. Um, but it's not. It's turned out to be this uh, this coronavirus that we weren't expecting. But, you know, you know, Carl, I, I think and it sounds absurd to say this from where we are now. I think we've actually been quite lucky because this is a viral pandemic that's got thankfully, thankfully, a relatively low uh, death rate. It's not as transmissible as the measles virus or, or other viruses. So we could have had a virus that made that zoonotic spillover leap from the animal reservoir or, or from the, you know, the, it, outside there, there's about 10 to the 23, 24 viral types, you know, that, m m more than we can possibly imagine. We could have had a virus that infected people that was as transmissible as measles and as deadly as whatever you want to take, t take Ebola or, or, or take the Middle East respiratory syndrome. You know, we, we could have had a virus that had those characteristics. So if this pandemic with relatively low death rates, terrible, but, but relatively low compared to what it could have been, and relatively low transmissible, still, still enough to cause a pandemic, but lower than it could have been. If we've learned from that, that pandemics form a, a, a real existential threat to the future of humanity, that, that, then maybe we've got off lightly, lightly. maybe that, that's a good thing. If the, yeah. if the death rate was higher with this, um, if it was as uh, deadly as, let's say, Ebola, would that then make the the spread 
uh, less possible, though. I mean, is it? No, no, no. It, it, it would probably still spread in the same way. It, it depends. It depends. The, 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 re- the reason really that we have this pandemic now is with SARS coronavirus, too, that people are most transmissible, immediate, shed most virus immediately before they get sick and immediately after they get sick. So, for example, the Middle East respiratory syndrome, we still get the odd case of that, mostly in Arabia from from camels. It's another coronavirus. But the reason that didn't become a pandemic, I I think this was first identified in 2008, 2009, something like that. But the reason this didn't become a pandemic is not because it's not transmissible, but because that the, the people shed their highest viral load when they were at their sickest. So when people first got ill, if they isolated at that point, they were shedding a remarkably low viral load. Then a week later, when they were very sick, they were shedding high viral loads. So what happened when, when Middle East respiratory syndrome first came along is quite a few healthcare professionals died who were actually looking after these patients when they were shedding high viral load. But because you can say that person's really sick, therefore that person needs isolated, then it was containable and we didn't have a pandemic. The whole problem with this is that people are transmitting it when they're feeling fine. That, that, that is the issue, or when they're just a bit pre or just starting to feel ill. So um, we could have had a virus which was really deadly and really quite transmissible as well. Um, we've been, I still think we've been fortunate. Yeah, I was going to say that, um, that that's exactly the, the, the reason why they were able to contain MERS and SARS is because mm-hmm. of the lack of pre-symptomatic uh, transmission. Uh, but I, I didn't answer that question about whether or not there's going to be another pandemic. The answer is yes. It's it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when is the next pandemic. I mean, there are so many coronaviruses in bats. There are so many uh, possibilities of the flu. It, and and if you are sitting back and looking at this from the last year and thinking, wow, how poorly did our government act and, and, uh, and get, in terms of, of, of helping and, and getting things rolled around, that should be an impetus to every single person listening to this, to look at their own lives and say, what is it that I can do to make sure that my immune system is in tip top shape and ready to, um, to, to meet this next pandemic whenever it happens? And not just to do it for the pandemic, because here's the great thing, it's, it's redundancy. The things that you can do to improve your immune system to handle the next pandemic are exactly the same things that you can do to have a more healthy and longer and less symptomatic life on this planet. And it, and it all boils around just having the right dietary choices, exercising, doing all these things. It's, it's amazing that everything lines up in the same direction. For some yeah. people, it's been a wake up call and, and they've made those those changes. They become more interested in their own health care and in the things that they can do. And, and here's the key. I think one of the big things for 2020, Kyle, to answer that very first question is people are learning that preventative medicine lifestyle changes now can have a big impact down the line and, and be a, a benefit in multiple different ways. It is. It's it's amazing. Things that are good for the individual in the short term are good in the long term and also pretty well are good for the good for the planet. You know, eat food, not too much, mostly plants sort of (laughs) sort of sort of philosophy. And on that point, slightly slightly broader point, Kyle, but I really do need think we need to rethink our relationship with animals because, you know, the the, the viruses because we're animals, the viruses we are most prone to getting. You know, we're not likely to get sick with bacteria phages. They're viruses that specialize in infecting bacteria. We're not so likely to get sick with with viruses that affect plants or fungi. They are specialists to those organisms. The ones that are going to spill over into us are from animals. And, um, you know, the the obvious example is the the wild animal trade in in Asia, for example, which is still is still going on at quite a quite a level. But, But the huge what you could call monoculture that we have. You know, we'll breed up millions of cows or pigs or chickens with very little genetic diversity between them. And that really is is a potential recipe for new emerging viruses. So I really think we just need to rethink our our whole ecological relationship with the planet and with animals in particular to prevent this happening again. Well, I think that's a good segue into um maybe both of you sharing a little bit about your uh, some of your own personal choices as far as um, 
your routine to stay stay safe from COVID-19 or lifestyle uh, things that you participate in or, or supplements. And, you know, I know we could spend another hour on this. So let's try to be brief with this answer. But I'll start with you, uh, Dr. Schweld, on this one. Some highlights of your own um, strategies for that. Yeah, so I, I look back on this very early in the pandemic when I really didn't have a lot of choices for my patients because things hadn't come down. We didn't even know about steroids. And the first question I had was, well, what did we do back in 1919 when we had this? You know, we didn't have oxygen in, hosp in the hospitals at that time. They wore masks. They knew that. Um, but a lot of the things that I saw, uh, looked, looking back before the advent of antibiotics and, and medications, FDA trials and, and randomized controlled uh, treatments and trials and things of that nature, was this uh, basically focus on adapting and, and improving the immune system, the, the person's own immune system, to deal with what it was that they were dealing with. And this dichotomy came about. We, we talked about this on a number of our uh, MedCram uh, updates uh, Dr. Yoreg, who was a Austrian psychiatrist who used the fever of malaria to treat his neurosyphilis uh, patients. Mm. We started to research a little bit about what does hyperthermia do to the body. You know, it's one of those natural systems of the body to cause a fever when you have a, a viral infection. And we saw that uh, increasing the body temperature, whether it be through saunas, hot water baths, things of this nature, can improve uh, interferon, which is one of those things that we found out pretty early on that's lacking in the early part of COVID-19. And so just as a personal choice, I didn't have any randomized control data, but I certainly wanted to take something that wasn't very risky at all and apply it to my own life, uh, doing something like contrast showers, where I take a hot shower and then followed by a cold shower. That's been shown to improve the immune system. Um, there's even uh, techniques of hydrotherapy, where you can uh, place hot towels on the, on the body to, to warm up and increase core body temperature. Um, going into a sauna, going into a spa. We looked at Finland early on. So these are things that I've done um, as well. If I, if I feel like I've, I'm coming down with something, I don't know if it's COVID-19 or just a regular cold, I'll do this. You know, I've supplemented with vitamin D. We've talked about that. I've noticed that uh, this is the, you know, I used to get catch uh, pretty bad flu every year, even though I'd get the flu vaccine. Uh, and I still recommend doing that. And uh, you know, this is not a cure-all. This is not something that's going to protect me 100%. The vaccine doesn't even protect 100%. So I still do social distancing. I still do wear masks when I go to the hospital. I do all of those things. But in addition to all of that, um, I've been I've been going into the sauna or the spa, doing uh, contrast showers. If if somebody calls me and they've had COVID-19 or they have it, I'll, I'll tell them to do all of the standard stuff. But I'll also say, hey, try this as well, uh, so long as there's no contraindications to it. So I, I think it's... Um, you know, think about this. If, if it does turn out to work, and I think randomized controlled trials are, are definitely needed for hydrotherapy and COVID-19, but if it works, this is something that somebody could do in their own home while they're waiting to see whether or not they get sick enough to be admitted to the hospital. It's not costly. Nobody needs to write a prescription. It can come out of the, the, the bath, and, and you can do it right there. So I, I think it's, it's pretty low risk, so long as they don't have, you know, they don't burn themselves or they don't have issues with uh, arrhythmias with hyperthermia. And it's enjoyable. And showers are wash, yeah. showers are wash the virus away as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. I'm really glad you brought up that point about fever. This I've been trying to teach this for a long, long time. You know, the, the reason that the body has a fever in response to a bacterial or a viral infection is not a mistake. It's, it's not the body getting it wrong. You know, there are specific pyrogens, fever-inducing cytokines that are highly specific that fit into totally specific receptors in the hypothalamus that trigger detailed prostaglandin-based mechanisms right in the brain that, that, that adjust the fever mechanism and, and put the temperature uh, set point up so that the body warms up to it. This is not a mistake. It's, it's a beautiful, detailed piece of physiology. And then for me to come along with some paracetamol or Tylenol and just get rid of it, you know, you know, to me, to me, it was just the height of arrogance, you know, as, as if we know better. It really is important to differentiate between symptomatic treatments and causal treatments. So if, if I have a splinter, I, I could pull that splinter out and take away the pain. That would be a causal treatment. Or I could give myself intravenous diamorphine and take away the pain, which would be a symptomatic <laughs> treatment. You know, you know, we really need to look at what is causal and go with the causal stuff. And um, fever is... is you know, basically, when you're at home, when you actually get when you actually get an infection, fever really in that day is your only defense. 
Yeah. You know, that, that that is what is helping you. Now, I agree with Roger 100 percent. We need to optimize this. We need good nutrition. Um, the, the, the vitamin D. I, I wish we were just monitoring vitamin D routinely. My, my GP won't my general practitioner won't, won't do my vitamin D levels. It's not done as standard. Um, you know, why? Why aren't we doing this now? It's not that you're going to make your immune system better. If your immune system, Kyle, is working perfectly and you look sort of young and fit and healthy, I'm sure it is. Um, what I can't do is make your immune system better. I can't improve that. I can't improve your optimized physiology. But there's so many things can reduce the efficiency of your immune system. You know, like 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 lack of vitamin D, which is an immunomodulator. Lack of protein, for example, is going to we know, we know for a long time that. Uh, people with protein deficiency are more prone to infections because they can't make the antibodies. So there's so many things that can reduce the efficiency of the immune system. If you smoke cigarettes, that's going to paralyze the cilia in, in your respiratory system. So um, what we want to do is optimize the efficiency of your immune system. And, and, and that's that, that, that's what we can do. We, we can't make it better. So there's no such thing as a tonic or a booster. We can just make it as good as the physiology allows it to be. Well, Dr. Campbell, uh, Dr. Schwell has talked about, well, first of all, Dr. Schwell's made it very clear this is not about giving medical advice and any supplement Absolutely or medication mm -hmm. should be mm -hmm. discussed with yeah. one's own medical yeah. professional. That Absolutely. said, mm -hmm. Dr. Schwell has shared uh, the, the level of vitamin D he's taking. Um, do you, you're up in northern, northern England. There it is. There's your vitamin D. Um, <laughs> So two two questions. If you're comfortable sharing it, no problem. If you're not, yeah, yeah, yeah. what dose? Yeah, no, no. What dose do you take? Yep. and uh, right, right. Do you take it all year? Yep, right. Good, good question. Uh, th one of my hobbies is growing plants. So in England, we have we have a, a plot of land called an allotment, which you rent off the council. So it's not. This is unpleasant, and I wouldn't normally share it, but I take my shirt off and uh, get, get plenty of sun exposure during the summer. Um, now, now the, the, you're going to make vitamin D when the sun is, is 45 degrees or higher in the sky. And you, you're going to make, if, if, you, if you're in your shorts, for example, and you, you, you've got your torso and your, uh, your legs exposed to vitamin D, in, in half the time it takes you to get sunburned. So if it takes you two hours to get sunburned on a particular day, if you're out for an hour in that time, you're going to make about 20,000 units of vitamin D. Wow. Uh, and, and we, we know that that, that oh, of course, that that is if you're the same color as me. <laughs> the, the, no, the, it's a really important point. Darker yeah. colored skin people are going to make it more slowly. Yeah. So um, and, and, and the, 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 this is big studies have been done on this in the States. African-Americans have much lower vitamin D levels than, than, than white Americans. Hispanic Americans have lower levels of vitamin D. And what have we seen in the differential of the um of the severity of the COVID and indeed of the death rates. So, so, you know, for, for me, I'm going to, I'm going to make uh, vitamin D about 20,000 units. We know we can store vitamin D and we know that the fat soluble vitamins are ADEC, A, D, E, and K. And when I, when I was, when I was learning this, and it's probably the same for Roger and for you, Carl, um, if it was drummed into our heads that you can get fat soluble vitamin, uh, hypervitaminosis, and, uh, you know, you, you can overdose on A, D, E and K. And this was kind of drummed into people. And I think this is part of the problem. But it turns out that people aren't storing vitamin D over winter. They're not storing it for long enough. So when I get the sun at more, at more, than, at more than 45 degrees and I get some overall body exposure. In medicine, we have this thing called the rule of nine. It's, it's how much body surface area you expose. So an arm is nine, uh, an arm is nine, front of the leg is nine, back of the front of the leg, back of the leg is nine each. So a leg is 18, torso is 18, back is 18. So it's how much of that surface area you're exposing. So I, I kind of build that up and then um, I kind of guess how much vitamin D is that's made. Now, the great thing about sun exposure, if, you, if you're exposed to the sun for longer, yes, it's bad for the skin and you've got risks of melanoma and things like that. But you homeostatically stop producing higher amounts of vitamin D. It will get to a higher and higher level, then it will stop. Whereas when you take supplements, uh, that, that's not the case. So most guidelines will say don't take more than uh, 4,000 international units of vitamin D a day. That's kind of the guidelines in the UK is, is the top amount. And that, that's, 100, that's 100 micrograms. So, so what I've been doing since, since 
since uh, let me see since september when the sun is no longer at 45 degrees in the sky because i live pretty far north i've been taking 2000 units a day uh which is 50 micrograms it, it probably I probably I'm going to increase that now a bit because now it's completely pretty well completely dark all day, so I'm probably going to go probably going to go up to 75 micrograms a day, which is is 3,000 uh, international units. And the other important thing is is a fat soluble vitamin, so take it with fatty food. It will be absorbed. Uh, I have no evidence for this, but I believe it will be absorbed more efficiently if you take it with meals. So the short answer to your question question, Kyle, is is 2,000 international units a day, which is 50 micrograms. And so when the shirt stays on while you're gardening, that's your cue to t- start taking the vitamin D supplement. Pretty, pretty, pretty well. It's it, it, w- w- when your when your shadow is is longer than you are, <laughs> you, you, you're you know the 45 degree thing in the sky, you're not making very much. And uh, you, you know hu- human beings are are tropical creatures. We're, we're not supposed to live as far north. You guys, you, you live in California. That's much 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 more sensible approach to life. <laughs> But, but, you know, I, I live way, way in the north and, uh, you know, basically we're only making vitamin D for probably four or five months of the year. Yeah. yeah and, and you'd be surprised at how many people, even in Southern California, are vitamin mm. D deficient. We mm. we are creatures that live inside. Mm. There was a recent survey that was done in the United States. I think seven percent of our waking hours are outside. Mm-hmm. We like to go in uh, in buildings, and the and the the paradox is is that we recently had an outbreak here in the United States, uh, a co- increase in the, in cases in the early part of the summer in Arizona and in Texas and in Florida, places that you would not expect to see that based on what we've just talked about. But you realize that people are going inside because it's hot outside, and they're staying out of the sun on purpose. And you've got air conditioning uh, that's blowing the virus around inside and not doing a lot of ventilation with, with new air. So all of this can be explained pretty easily. Absolutely. It, it, it's cheaper not to cool more air, or when it's cold, it's cheaper not to heat more air, so they tend to recycle more. And, of course, that, that, that's going to recycle the, the aerosolized droplets and the droplets from the infection. Now, I'll just say one more thing, Carl. The, 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 the thing that really convinced me about vitamin D was um, they, they dug up a skeleton in my country in a place called Cheddar Gorge that was 15,000 years old. And they looked at the DNA in this skeleton. And from that, they could tell that this guy, and it, it was a man, they could tell he had blue eyes and, and really quite dark colored skin. So the English had dark colored skin 15,000 years ago. And the, the advantage to being white is you make more vitamin D more quickly. So the, the original humans um, w- would all have dark colored skin. We, we are tropical creatures. So um, the, the, orig- the original evolution of humans or if, if you believe in creation adam and eve that they would be dark colored the the yeah. the adapt the, the adaptive advantage the adaptive advantage as we go further north to allow us to colonize further north is that we make more vitamin d so the only but i know of two biological advantages to being white because it's a stupid idea because you get sunburned but the advantages are you make vitamin d more quickly and, and we also make, uh, I think, is it nitric oxide? I think, I think, Roger, that, that reduces blood pressure and dilates, you know, so um, uh, the, 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 the photochemical effects on the skin. But the main one is vitamin D. So that, that is why we changed, our ancestors changed from being dark colored to being light colored. That's how important it is to get enough vitamin D. Well, and then we also know that just sun exposure itself tends to uh, to, to have more melanin in, in mm. the skin. But the other the other thing I thought was interesting is, is those cultures that tend to do sauna bathing, uh, et cetera, are are typically northern latitude uh, cultures like the Finns, the Swedes, the Germans. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And heating the body temperature up and helping your immune system that way. Absolutely. Yeah. One other point yeah. on vitamin D, since we're since we've talked quite a bit about vitamin D is um potential vitamins to take with it. And I know there's not a lot of data on this, but I've looked at the data and I've been convinced to take uh, vitamin K2 and some magnesium Mm -hmm. along with my vitamin D when I take it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Schweltz talked about this recently in videos. What are your thoughts on that, Dr. Kim? Yeah, I don't know a lot about that, but but the, the, the problem is if you take a huge amount of vitamin D, and you'd have to work pretty hard at this, but it can increase your blood calcium. And, and, and then from the from the blood, it can go and you can calcify tissues. 
So, uh, you know, in some people you can get this like uh, calcification of tissues, which, which is a bad idea. You don't want to calcify your your heart muscle, for example. And my understanding is that the vitamin K2 helps to keep it out of the tissues, but I don't really have any detailed knowledge on that. But I, th I think you'd have to take pretty large doses of vitamin D for that to be a problem. Whereas vitamin K deficiency, it's not something we really hear about. You know, a normal balanced diet will give you enough vitamin K. Excellent. Well, we are about at the, let's see, hour and a half mark. Uh, so wow! Really? <laughs> <laughs> wow! It's been fun. John. It's it's so it's just so neat, so nice. Just I feel like I'm I'm in your living room uh, and we're uh, you sipping are. a cup you, of tea you, and uh, you we're are. just talking. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, next time we should yeah, have a cup yeah. of whiskey. Uh, to... <laughs> Afterwards, Carl. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I'll go for that. I think there's yeah. some antiviral effect to that. Um, uh, uh, in high concentrations of above sixty percent, yeah. <laughs> but this is may, may not, there is some evidence actually that alcohol actually could could increase the risk of uh, of um, a viral uh, transmission, at least in the mucosa, yeah. the upper mucosa. But anyway, yeah. always the no, voice no, of reason. No, 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 there, there is actually a serious point there, people. And uh, I've been talking. I don't know if you've seen any of the videos, but I talked to a professor of immunology in in Baghdad. And she's got friends in Iran, and they, they were actually drinking uh, eth um, methanol, toxic alcohol. Ooh. So, so, so th th they thought that because you have a 60% of solution of alcohol that cleans your hands, obviously to drink it, they thought it would be better. And there's been fatalities. It's just absolutely, you know, the, 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 the need for clear information is just so o overwhelming, you know, so... So just to clarify, let's keep the alcohol on their hands and not not drink too much. <laughs> but in terms of anti of antivirals, yeah, I agree. Yeah, and and I would just say as a as a as a comment, Kyle and John, um, that if anybody in a medical authority in the UK is listening, please, please, please uh, uh, prioritize giving the vaccine here to uh, Dr. John Campbell because he is a national treasure, <laughs> and we need more and more people like him all around the world that are saying the same message and hopefully it'll it'll uh, increase the validity and the believability of what we're saying which is true and people start to listen to and um, and hopefully we'll make some progress thank you for that Roger I guarantee that I'll fall on deaf ears but I'm, <laughs> I, I, I am delighted you've had yours <laughs> there, thank you there is one more question I had written down that I want to yeah, ask Kyle, you yeah. both and, and we'll uh, We'll wrap this up. And it's just about testing. So looking back at the year 2020, um, what lessons can we learn from, from testing for COVID-19? And what developments do you hope to see moving forward in 2021 for uh, COVID-19 testing? Because we're not out of the woods yet. If you as you both have pointed out, the vaccine uptake is going to take some time. And we have no guarantees that the vaccine, how long it's going to work for. We hope very long, but we, we don't know that for sure. So um, what are your thoughts on testing? I'll start with you, uh, Dr. Schwab. So one of the things that was perplexing to me early on was that everybody was coming up with their own tests and it was taking a, such a long time. I think the U.S. took uh, 46, 47 days uh, to, to develop their own uh, test, whereas the, 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 you know, the, the, the Asians had their own test already. Why did we have to, to do and waste all of that time? And why are we now a year later, still having issues with uh, testing availability, not getting results back within 24 hours. I think we may have had, I think that the term that summarizes it is that the, the good is not the enemy of the perfect. We, we wanted perfection. And because of that, we got, uh, we were basically a mile wide and an inch deep. Whereas if we thought this more rationally, looking at antigen testing, you know, we've had Dr. Michael Minna on to talk about the, the possibility of using daily antigen testing, or at least three times a week antigen testing to find out with Southern, whether someone is infectious. This may be the answer to opening up schools. Um, and I, I think that's really where we need to go uh, in terms of this. Hopefully they don't get their act together before the whole pandemic's over. Hopefully the pandemic becomes over very shortly. But if it doesn't, I think a lesson to be learned there is to not treat this like a laboratory diagnostic test, uh, but rather a epidemiological tool mm. to get this thing under control. Mm. Mm. No, I, I agree completely. I don't know if you've got the saying there, but in England we say, why reinvent the wheel? 
you know, it's already been invented once. And, and, and the World Health Organization have made a few things that we might question in, in this pandemic. But one of the good things they did way, way back in the early days, this would be in January, they put together a kit and an instruction manual on how to produce simple tests. And the authorities in Thailand that they delayed by almost 20 hours while they made this test. You know, they literally did it the next day. It was fantastic. And they were testing people in Thailand, I think, on the 23rd of January. You know, it was really, really quite early. Uh, the, the CDC wanted to go their own way, as, as Roger said, 43, 44 uh, day delay. And, and that, that's when that's when the pandemic took root in the United States. It was such a tremendously unfortunate wasted opportunity that that, that happened. So I, th I think one of the big morals here is if someone invents something good, let, let's just copy that. Let's just follow that. So, um, you know, the, the, the Pfizer Moderna vaccines are brilliant. They were developed in the States. I'll have that. You know, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine was developed in, in the UK. The, 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 they're spreading that out now in India. The Indians are plan planning to vaccinate 300 million people in the next few months. And I think they're going to do it. I really do. Because but they're using basically they're using partly a British vaccine, but they're not saying, oh, that's British. We'll make our own Indian one. They have made their own Indian one as well, but they're using both. You know, let, let's use anything we've got here and let's just have so much more international communication. You know, we, we've been teaching the t t speech, speaking the same language of science here. You know, we understand each other. Um, there's no reason why this shouldn't be done much more internationally altogether. Schools, probably a slightly different one. In the UK, they're talking about mass rollout of the lateral flow tests for schools here, which, of course, are, are less reliable. And there is some early data from Liverpool where the, in, the, in the UK where they did mass screening and, and, uh, on lateral flow tests that people were changing their behaviour because they got a negative result. Mm. So uh, as, as Roger said, as an epidemiological tool, yes, this is absolutely vital. We can't, if we haven't got a, a, an epidemiological tool to, to make this invisible virus visible, then we're fighting an invisible enemy, which is, is a bit tricky. But um, it did concern me that people in Liverpool were getting this negative test. There is a lot of false negatives. And then there were visiting elderly, elderly relatives, for example, which is not a good thing. So I'm not quite sure that it can work in practice in schools. And as well as that, you could have a negative test that was a genuine negative test. And then literally 10 minutes later, you could be infected. So yeah. um, I'm, I'm not quite sure if that's the way to go. I, I think we've got some pretty hard decisions to make over this just next two or three months while we're waiting for the virus to kick in. But any tool we've got, let's use it. Absolutely. Mm. Well, let's uh, this has been a great uh, discussion. Thank you both so much. And uh, any parting words before we uh, we wrap it up, Dr. Campbell? No, I, I've, I've, I can't believe it's been so long. I, it's <laughs> really, really interesting to talk to you, gentlemen. I really appreciate the opportunity. And it's, uh, uh, I'm curious to see if anyone watches this video. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if you've made it until now in the interview, congratulations. Well, with us. yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Should we have an award or something? Yeah. For this? Yeah. <laughs> Entire certificate or something. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. Again, um, John, thank you so much for, for joining us. I, I hope that we do this again soon, especially if there's uh, new updates and things as they as they progress. Um, this has gone so well, and I really appreciate you joining us. And uh, it was a pleasure to be here. Yeah. And the other thing, Carl, that a lot of people don't realize is that, that Roger and myself have a large back catalog of videos mm. from uh, from pre-COVID days, which are yep. uh, somewhat neglected now. So Absolutely. If, you, if you're bored one evening, there's no reason to not be stimulated. Absolutely. That's correct. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank, yeah. to everyone watching, thanks for joining us. Thanks again for submitting questions for this. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, we hope to do this again and see you all soon. Hey, thank you. Yeah. And I would just say, uh, have everyone um, look at both of our uh, channels here. Uh, we both have channels on YouTube, and there's a lot of information on both these channels that are that are not redundant, uh, and uh, but rather uh, supplementary and complementary. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely, yep. And you can Absolutely. also check out our website, medcram.com. Dr. Campbell, do you have a website, or is it primarily? No, not at the moment. Not at the moment. No, no. I had technical problems with that. You got I often have technical problems. <laughs>
<laughs> I was just one of them. I doubt that since you're putting videos out <laughs> daily and I'm, I'm sure you've got them pretty, pretty well dialed in by now. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> All right. Well, you're very humble and a very, and a gentleman. Thank you so much. No, th thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.